As we get into our program, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Chris Weeks. He is the Regional Aquaculture Extension Specialist uh, for the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center and Michigan State University. Um, he is, uh, has over 15 years of experience in sustainable aquaculture development. Chris's background and experience includes strategic planning for aquaculture sectors, business development, production system design and management, aquatic animal health, bait fish, regulations, and aquatic nuisance species. So with that, please help me welcome Chris Weeks to the podium. Uh, thanks, Brian. Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful, refreshing morning, isn't it? Uh, I can say that I got in last night, took a little run down the Skunk River Trail, and just breathing that fresh air in. I love Ames. Um, with, the, with the title of my talk, I was talking with Joe Morris last night. If, if you're picturing a, if, you, if you're here for a, a rosy presentation, you're not going to get it from me. Um, but what I am going to tell you is kind of where we're at. My goal here today is to answer, to, to at least provide information <clears throat> to help answer a couple primary questions. Number one, is farm seafood perhaps humanity's best option for a healthy and sustainable protein supply? And two, if so, what's the role of the United States going to be in this? Well, to get at some of that, uh, 2002, global aquaculture value was about $135 billion. It's 66 million tons of, of production. The forecast for 2013 is an additional $60 billion and uh, quite an increase in, in both uh, value and, and volume. <clears throat> another 11 years from now, we're expected another $100 billion increase in production. Um, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. And if, if you look right here, what, what it is is the demand for seafood is going up, but our wild harvests are basically flat. Our maximum harvest or sustainable yield is either exceeded. Everything else that's going to come from seafood is going to have to come from aquaculture. How's that going to look? Right now in 2012, about 50% of the world's seafood production comes from fish production. By 2030, it's expected to be about 62%. What's driving this is global demand for meat. We're doing a better job at feeding people. There's a growing middle class, especially in Asia. So if you look at the population demand and the, and the increased consumption of meat supply, it's expanding at a rapid rate. What's the per capita, the global per capita consumption of meat right now? If we look here, wild and farmed fish is at the top of the list. So about 24 kilograms per person per year, uh, followed by pork. This is, if we see this trend right here going up, it's following the farm fish production. Um, we see poultry uh, obviously rising quite a bit too. Beef production is relatively flat. And uh, for the first time, farm fish actually surpassed beef, beef in terms of per global per capita consumption. Again, I talked about the driving demand for meat consumption. Well, it's really not happening in the United States. United States meat consumption is staying just about r right on the population growth. What's happening is the meat consumption in China right now is going at a phenomenal rate. So we call it feeding the beast. China's pull for seafood at this time right now is pretty phenomenal. From 2005 to 2025, the seafood consumption in China is expected to triple. I plotted 2008-2009 values. Those are the recent values I could get, and they are right on track to keep this trend. Why is seafood perhaps one of the most important protein supplies for the world? Well, it's a pretty simple matter of feed conversion. This is out of National Geographic, so this received quite a bit of ex exposure. But it takes 6.8 pound, 6 pounds of feed to produce one pound of, of cow, 2.9 for pigs, 1.7 for chickens. And because fish are ectotherms, they're cold-blooded, they're very efficient at converting protein over to, to body weight. And so that's the draw right now for fish. 
Well, how does aquaculture look on a global scale as far as where, where the products are grown? We see that 60% of world's aquaculture right now is grown in fresh water or inland systems, which bids very well for places like Iowa. 35% global production in carp. Now, we don't need a whole lot of carp, but over in Asia, where, where uh, most of the seafood is actually grown and consumed, carp is very big. Guess what the number one, uh, what the number one aquaculture product in the world is? It's grass carp. If we look at global production by region, we see that 80% of, of the global production is in Asia. In America, it's only 5%. In the United States, I'll show a little bit later, it's much less than that. Uh, why is it so much higher over there? Well, it's cheap labor for one, the access to natural resources, and also induced conditions for our culture. By, say, induced conditions, it's typically a social, political, and regulatory condition. Here's an example. <clears throat> I got on Google the other day, and I wanted to find places in the world where you actually could see this from outer space. Uh, so I went to Luan Bay, China. And if we look over here, we have a delta coming through here. We have the bay. And we see kind of an interesting structure from outer space right here. If we zoom in on that, it looks even more interesting. We have here a, a shipping canal here. We have the bay. We see this interesting structures going on. And if we zoom in even closer, we see just rows and rows and rows of these rectangles. And so the nice thing about uh, Google Earth is actually go in and hit some of these pictures. <coughs> and what these actually are, are just massive rows and rows of aquaculture production facilities. And so we see here, we see cages with fish in them, along with these uh, kelp lines. So, so they're growing both fish and vegetables, sea vegetables, I guess it's called. We look at another one. Uh, we can see this similar structure. And we look at one here by the channel, and so you see these tourist boats going right by all these, these cage cultures. Very interesting. Actually, Luan Bay is actually called a floating city. Uh, what's interesting here is, is all those cages, they actually have these pathways going up through here so they can get access. Now, you look at this, a floating city, and, and I bet they don't have indoor plumbing, right? Well, they don't. So there's always a concern of, of fish coming into the United States that's unhealthy and safe. They've actually done some studies with this red sea bream in Japanese. What they found is the toxins in the fish that they pulled out of there were actually quite low. And so what they're seeing is that they're actually finding ways to harvest the stuff, the nutrients, the toxins, and stuff that may be going in the water they're actually being able to pull those out at very low levels. And they're also combining fish with, with uh, seafood or with vegetable. Can. So it's, it's a very interesting concept that they have developed over there. Another example, we hear about catfish coming in from Vietnam. So I said, well, let's see what they got in Vietnam. This is Mekong Delta, Vietnam. If you zoom in on, let's say, this area here, you again start to see some interesting structures going on inside. We see maybe some canals going in here. If we focus on this area right here, sure enough, we see canals going in here for, for traffic, and we see that they, they also have traffic on here. But look at these are, these are actually built really, really, uh, you know, there, a lot of thought went into this. And so this is an area uh, in Vietnam where the bulk of the majority is, is small producers but they've actually just got an incredible co-op here that it could produce one of the biggest freshwater aquaculture uh, outputs in the world. Zoom in even further and you can start to see these fish harvest structures. So they put a lot of effort and they've really developed uh, an incredible market. In fact, 2011, their, their exports in fish production exceeded $3.4 billion. $3.4 billion, now that's quite a bit especially when the United States production alone is only about 1.37 billion. And that's just in this area here. And we, t we hear about, you know, fish coming in again, the, the whole fish safety thing and, and the healthy seafood. Well, 15% of these farms now are globally certified over in Mekong or over in Vietnam. 
So what's happening, and that's happened only in the last five years. So there's gl these global certification programs going on that are actually starting to look at, and toxicology might be one of them, but they're also looking at environmental practices. Walmart will not take fish without this certification. Neither will Whole Foods. So they're actually going and certify. We're going to see more and more of this going on. In fact, we're going to see more on the front end where, where they're going to these farms, they're checking them for toxicology, and then they're shipping them over to the United States because we hear that USDA can only inspect about, I guess it's FDA now, about 1, one or 2 percent. Well, from a marketing standpoint, they're on top of this, and this going to be, we're going to see more and more of this going on. <clears throat> now, those were very low, low uh, extensive systems, very um, low labor, very low cost expensive system or uh, extensive systems. On the other end of the scale, uh, we have these indoor very expensive systems. This is uh, one that just recently went up in, in Abu Dhabi. It's about a $115 million facility. They're going for a very high end, very high intensive, uh, very cost, costly, but they're going to, to cut caviar. So we have this whole gamut in between these very high indoor extensive, intensive systems, these very low cost extensive systems. So our culture falls in between all, all, all over the place. So what's going on in our culture, US versus the world? First thing to point out, uh, this left axis here is the world production, or yeah, it's world volume in million metric tons. And it's on a log scale to what's being produced in the United States. So this is 100 times greater than what we're seeing over here. Here's the trend that's going on in the, in the global, in the world. We've got about 90.4 million metric tons being produced. In the United States, we have uh, only 4.46% of that. If we look at or, uh, value, again, we have log scale over here. This is in million, million USDs. And this is the United States uh, value over here. And if we plot this out, we put in trend lines, we see that uh, the United States is sort of on a linear trend, kind of following our population growth, uh, with a pretty good fit. If we look at what's going on value-wise on a global scale, we see it's more of a polynomial fit with a very good fit. Essentially, the bottom line is, is the value of our culture is increasing on a global pace much faster than it is in the, in the United States. But what are some trends going on in the United States? Number one, our seafood deficit is going in the wrong direction. So this is imports of seafood versus exports. Uh, over the last few years, it's increasing at about a billion dollars a year. Also, our seafood consumption on a per capita basis Back in 2004, it was two pounds more. Americans ate two pounds more fish than they're eating today. So there was a study done to try to get at some of this information, uh, 2008 Hicks. They asked consumers, why aren't you eating as much seafood, or why aren't you eating a lot of seafood? Number one, taste preference. People really don't know how to cook fish. Affordability was also mentioned, and negative messages from media. So we hear a lot in the media. There is a lot of media coming out right now. Fish is good for you. No, it's bad for you. It's good for you. Here's the great example. A special report, government wants you to eat more seafood, but at the same time, can you risk eating it because of mercury? So really, we don't know how to deal with that. We're not addressing this very well. I think there's, we need to get our messages better straightforward. So the same study kind of, in, in the survey, they tried to get at, well, where can we target our messaging? And the number one answer for where people prefer to get their messaging from, of course, is the media, followed by the internet, health newsletter, and physicians. So obviously, we need to do a better job probably right here on the media and internet. We need to get a cohesive message out there we need to really get the, the information out to the consumers. And talk is as well, maybe we're not going to do a very good job with the consumers. So who else can we target? Basically the retailers and the chefs and so forth. So I think that's the, that's the kind of direction we're taking at this point. 
you know, where can you be most effective? Um, and again, maybe the retailers. And, and that's what's trying to driving the certification program. All right, so now we can focus a little bit more on exactly what's going on in the United States. A recent uh, aquaculture census came out, and uh, this is the best information that we have. And we'll take a look at the blue first. The blue is the number of farms uh, in two, 1998, 2005, and 2013. And if we take a look at from 2005 to 2013, we've lost about 1,200 farms. So people were into the business and got out of the business. <coughs> you know, that's not a good sign for growing an industry. But at the same time, what's happened to the value of seafood, the value of products sold? Basically, it increased about 300, about $300 million. So we have less farms, less production, and much higher value. It's kind of an exciting place to be. If we look at the sectors, these are the different sectors that the aquaculture census broke it out into. We see sport fish stocking, growing for stocking, really is not a big piece of this pie. But at the same time, uh, between 2005 and 13, we did see a 31% increase. Bait fish took a pretty big hit. 2005, 2013, 22% reduction. Crustaceans grew pretty well, uh, mainly shrimp. We'll get into that a little bit more. Right now, mollusks or shellfish is the rising star of aquaculture. Uh, we'll show a little bit more of that. Food fish has stayed relatively the same. Taking a look at sport fish first. Um, one thing we're seeing is that the sport fish, food fish, we're starting to see a little bit of overlap where people can grow both let's say a fish, a fish such as largemouth bass for food size and also stocking. And that's probably a very good um, area to kind of focus on, a good strategy. What I want to notice here is that reds are reduction and anything in green is a fairly substantial increase. So largemouth bass, for instance, production dropped about half. Average price or average, average size of fish dropped quite a bit. But look at the increase. It went from $2 a pound to $5.32 a pound. Now, right now, largemouth bass is a very, uh, probably the most popular fish in the region as far as growing. And the reason is, is because it's, it's probably the most, it's, it's probably the best fish right now for the live ethnic market. It's getting premium dollars on the live ethnic markets. It, it's replacing live tilapia and others. So there's a lot of uh, producers right now that are really focusing on largemouth bass. Um, interesting here is, is as far as sport fish, musky. There's very few people producing musky, but those that do it are getting a lot of money for their musky. Walleye is also an interesting one. The state of Wisconsin uh, is really focusing on walleye right now. They're doing walleye indoors. Uh, for food fish production, they're trying. They're in the process of commercializing that. But you know, at this stage, what we're seeing is that people are getting more value for stocking them than they are for the food fish. So you know, that's something. That's a marketing aspect that it, once they once they are able to do this, they're going to have to really focus on. What about bait fish? I said they took a, a pretty good hit, 22 percent between 2005 2013. Part of that might be regulations. Uh, invasive species regulations, the Lacey Act, federal offenses, they may be very reluctantly, reluctant to give out their production numbers at this point. However, there is a, certainly a trend going on, and that is less fishing. These are uh, the number of fishing licenses sold in the state of Michigan. Basically a 40 to 50% drop from the uh, late 1880s to current time. I think with the economic situation we've had over the last couple of years, we see a little bit of rise here, but we do not foresee this trend changing around much. Essentially, we're seeing less fishing going on. So as far as bait fish goes, is there a big opportunity with bait fish? Probably not. Crustaceans, uh, we'll take a look at shrimp a little bit. This is a, a pure case of global, global market issue where we had a substantial increase in production in shrimp in the United States, but look what happened when we did. We, it was one of the only areas where we saw a, a drop in price. Prawns is interesting. Um, 
Look at this, it went from 556 a pound to 826 a pound in 2013. Right now it's a niche area, but uh, we see some in Ohio. I don't know if we're going to see more and more indoors or not, whether it's worth it, um, but certainly it is an interesting uh, opportunity. Certainly it, it could be marketable and could be a, a marketable campaign. Shellfish, I talked a little bit about the rising star, and it's not because of production numbers, it's because of value. If we look at clams alone, uh, pretty big drop in the production numbers. Uh, Manila here were the same, but look at the, inc the increase in price, almost doubled here, uh, high. So we're seeing a big increase in seafood demand and price for shellfish in the United States. These drops here, are being attributed to permitting issues. And I'm finding uh, more and more that permitting issues, both on the site and the effluents, are probably some of the biggest constraints to U.S. agriculture at this point. Uh, this total includes stockers, feelings, broodstock, and eggs, whereas these values here uh, only, only represent food market size. And what we're seeing is not a big change overall in the overall value of things, although somewhat of an increase here. Um, but it has not to, anything to do with our catfish industry. Our catfish industry has been struggling. Uh, if we look at stripe, striped hy, uh, hybrid bass or hybrid stripers, they stayed relatively the same. Moderate increase, tilapia moderate increase. Interesting enough here is grass carp has, has increased quite a bit. And the reason for that, I think, is because the movement by states right now are going from, from diploids uh, to, tr to, to triploids, and that's, uh, there's kind of a national movement now from uh, state and federal agencies to go that route. I think that reflects higher prices. And here's the value for trout. So uh, we're going to get more into these a little bit, but actually trout's kind of a rising area as well as far as value. Okay, next series of graphs show the pounds and millions and the amount per pound and the size of the fish between 2005 and 2013. So hybrid striped bass, not a significant gain, but we do see increase in price, pretty substantial. We also see from 2005, uh, really not much change in the average size of the fish. Tilapia, again, not a whole lot of change in volume. Um, we do see an increase in price, and we see a slight increase in, in the size of the fish. Um, 2013 is when Minocqua, which was our region's biggest tilapia farmer indoors, uh, went out of business. They closed doors, they shut down. Um, exactly why they did, I don't know. I heard there was maybe some, some, um, some internal struggle with s some value issues. But the bottom line is, is that the live tilapia ethnic market might be saturated at this point. We compare that to the staples that were here, look at this. 2005, we dropped almost 45% in the amount of catfish that were produced in, in the United States. Uh, somewhat followed by a little bit increase in demand, but getting point, you know, less than a buck a pound and convening with Vietnam is a very tough be place to be for catfish farmers right now. Trout production actually went down. Uh, dollars per pound went way up. Trout producers like this. Um, if there was a way to increase produ trout production right now, obviously it'd be a good place to be. Uh, we're, they're trying to do it in Michigan. I should say we're trying to do it in Michigan. We're running into serious permitting problems. One thing we're seeing in trout too is a tendency to go to bigger fillets. People want bigger fish. And I think it's kind of being driven by Ontario, Canada, who's coming over with a nice product. Uh, there's some folks here from Canada as well representing that industry. Grass carp, um, you know, it cleans out your pond. You can eat it too, right? Look at the value increase. Again, one59 or a buck fifty-nine to eight sixty-four, and in, in a matter of eight years. And again, I think it's the regulations that kind of that are driving that price increase. Yellow perch. Notice here we're in thousands, not millions. Uh, drop in production, moderate increase in price, the size of the fish, essentially, they're having trouble getting that product out. As compared to largemouth bass, big drop in volume, 
huge increase in price. So that's why people are excited with large mild bass. Here's a, here's a little exercise you might want to do too. So I wanted to figure out what's the cost of fingerling production, because fingerling production is kind of noted to, to be problems for the uh, yellow perch industry. So I laid this out. Market size, a third of a pound versus a pound and a half. Number of fish, then you would need three fish to get to a pound. Uh, finger lengths cost about this much per inch. These are the size that you're going to buy them in. These are the cost each. If you look at the mortality rate and the cull rate, essentially your total loss rate of 35%. What that's saying is that you need 4.6 fingerlings per pound of production for yellow perch. You need one fingerling per pound production of largemouth bass. So your cost in fingerlings are a buck 18 for perch and 25 cents for bass. That's pretty big, especially when you're getting three, what's it, 363 a pound here and five, five something a pound over here. So according to the census, who are the big losers and winners since 2005? Anybody selling catfish or bait fish shows up as a loser. Anybody over here growing shellfish shows up as winners. What's going on in the region? <clears throat> this is the number of farms from 1998, 2005, and 2013. A couple of points to point out here. States of Ohio growing in farms. State of Iowa, growing in farms. Iowa's right in the middle. Probably a good place to be. Folks look to be poised pretty well. If we look at value of production, we see that uh, Missouri is number one. Their primary output is pretty much largemouth bass. Minnesota used to be number one. They took a pretty big hit because their output is mainly uh, bait fish. Iowa here, we see, again, Ohio on the increase in value, Iowa pretty much on the increase in value. So what are the factors going in we need to consider? We have raw materials, which is feed, we have labor, and then we have everything else, the overhead. If you add these up, bottom line is they gotta be greater than the sales to consumer, or less than sales to consumer, otherwise you have to be subsidized in some manner, or you're gonna fail. You know, I see a lot of business plans come through with all these rosy pictures. You know, trying to slide that off to the bank to get money, that's not a really good way to do it because ultimately, if you're not realistic, likely you're going to end up down here. You're going to create higher risk for everybody else. So feed, raw materials. What can we expect going on here? Well, if we look at global food, we always hear about the global fish meal use. You know, our culture takes all this global fish meal. Well, indeed it does. I mean, from 1980 to 2010, we went from 10% in our culture to 73%. If we look at prices, somewhere along that same time, we see a, a pretty much skyrocket in prices going up. Probably threefold, 300% increase in prices of fish meal since this is starting to occur. However, if we kind of take a look at 2000 to 2008, we see what's going on with fish meal and where it's been going. Overall, we see, even though it's increasing for our culture, it's decreasing across the board, and it is actually going down here. Now, if we look at a broader scale here, and this is fish oil, and we see this is pretty stable. But if we look at the fish meal use, you know, what we do see is there are seasonal trends going on, based on you know, environmental conditions, which is El Nino. And we also see a lot of volatility. So essentially, what we're seeing is the point that fish meal use is going down, we're seeing substitution to things like plant-based products. And whether it's GMO, such as a plant-based product, or we're seeing genetic selection on the fish side. Soybean meal, and Steve Farts here is going to uh, probably talk about this a little bit more. Soybean meal is a very um, exciting area or a, a very good product that, could, that is being used to replace fish meal. And, and this is the big reason why. I mean, the cost of fish meal is way up here. And look at how volatile it really is. And here's the price of soybean meal. However, what I want to point out with this graph 
is this is terrestrial row crops and we see pricing indexes going up and down. We do see a lot of volatility in here and there are probably farmers in here who know a lot more about this than I do. I think the bottom line here though is we're going to see feed meal or feed prices continue to rise. So we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that and factor it in. Based on the value of product coming out, maybe we can do that, we can handle that. There is good news out there. There's a lot of media attention um, that seafood is good. Uh, this is the 2014 culinary forecast for the Re National Restaurant Association. Right up here, locally sourced meats and seafood are the top trends, sustainable seafood top trends. The message is getting out. Slowly but surely, the message is just getting out there. USDA, American Heart Association, studies have shown eating seafood is good for you. This message is starting to get out too. It's just being intermixed with, with other issues such as mercury. Again, we hear a lot about how safe seafood is for you, uh, especially the imports. The, there's a tendency to go locally. Let's take, I've, I've showed this graph before. How does the United States per capita fit in here? Well, in 2012, U.S. consumption per capita, we ate uh, 37 kilograms of poultry, 26 kilograms of beef, 20 kilograms of pork per person. This is where the USDA dietary guideline for seafood is, and this is what the Americans are eating right now. I see this as opportunity. It's a very good opportunity. To go from here to here means doubling aquaculture production. To go from here up to here is triple. We hear about greenhouse gas, the need to buy local. Uh, here's an interesting study, and, and I just do this because I did find it interesting. Is that a study here uh, looked at greenhouse gas life cycle, where all the costs for greenhouse is going. They're finding 20% or 11% goes to transportation. Producer to retail, only 4%. But switching over from red meat to seafood, it's 150%. So uh, bottom line is, is they deduce that shifting from red meat to uh, seafood or dairy or chicken or vegetables just one day a week uh, saves more greenhouse gas than buying all locally. So I think the answer to the first question I started at the beginning, um, I think there's a lot of evidence that out, there, out there that says, yes, seafood is extremely important globally. What's, what's going to happen? How the U.S., what's the role of U.S. going to be in there? You know, I think it's up to us. It's up to us here. And there are certain action. We have a call to action in order to get there. Number one, we need to continue to work on social acceptance, political will. We need engagement with stakeholders with state and tribal leaders. We need government endorsement. Essentially, we need to project or broadcast a message, our culture is open for business in our state. We need collaboration. And these are the sustainability is huge. We need to demonstrate our advancement through sustainable practices, social, environmental, economical. I think there's a lot of focus right now on these urban movements, and they're calling them sustainable. People have this concept that sustainability is urban, is, is combining it. Might be hitting two of the three pillars here, but they're not hitting all three pistons. We need to keep that in mind as we move forward. And how do we do that? First of all, we need to establish ourselves as an industry based on what we know today and the species that we can do it with. We need leadership, both on national, regional, and, and state levels. We need strong state associations. We need strong partnerships. Permitting and regulations, we need them simplified. We need them easy. They're very confusing. Each state has their own independent regulations. It's very difficult to maneuver through there. This is, this is my platform this year. Rather than in regulate through restriction, which the United States tends to do, we need to regulate through promotional aspects. So through effective regulations, promote sustainable industry practices. We need to invest in research and education and outreach. We need to focus on indoor recirculating systems. 
They're the fish productions of the future. We might be there right now. There are uh, demonstrations that it is feasible, but we need to continue to strive to, to reduce costs. Energy, 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 energy. How do we overcome the high energy costs with research systems? We, get, we see a lot of systems going in, a lot of failures. We get high risk, people can't get into it. We need to attract investment and we need to establish that message. We are open for business. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions. Over here. The question was, we had some permitting issues with trout, and what were those? Well, uh, a facility I actually used to run, a good friend of mine, he wanted to expand into an old state hatchery. Uh, the old state hatchery happened to be on the Grayling River. And the Grayling River is, there's some waters seven miles downstream that actually they label as the holy waters. So we kind of picked the wrong stream to do this in. He did, finally, it, after a year and a half, he was able to get his NPDS permit to expand. Right now, he's gonna be tied up in court probably for the next three or four years for people contending that issue. Also, there is uh, effort right now to potentially put a cage or two, uh, initially cage operation, in Michigan waters of the Great Lakes. State, or Ontario has, I believe, 10 facilities in there right now. So cage culture actually is going on the Great Lakes. Um, we're having some permitting issues trying to figure out whether that can be done in the Great Lakes. Uh, again, it's siting, so the, the cage culture is a siting aspect of it. And then the effluent, the output is another one. Also, you know, we have all this fresh water available. Um, to be able to tap into that water and, and for a new facility would be very difficult to do. Any more questions? Right here. So, Uh, the question, if I understand it correctly, we saw both increases in value across the board with, with both seafood and pork and, and beef. Uh, is there any correlation with those and as far as the product demand? Um, you know, that's a very good question. We have, the United States has such incredible resources available and um, our meat diets are engraved, and I think it will always, we will always have a very high proportion of red meat in our diets. I think what we're seeing there in the value is I think there is a little bit of, I wouldn't say hysteria, but there, I think there is more concern with safe and healthy seafood. And uh, that value that we saw, that value increase, is being primarily driven by the shellfish industry right now. A uh, shellfish industry in total value just passed the catfish industry, which forever has been our mainstay. So it has risen so fast that it's finally surpassed the, the catfish industry. So um, I, th I think what we're seeing in, in my mind in, is that we're seeing an increase in, in value for pork and beef, I think mainly because of drought conditions. Whereas the seafood, I think we're seeing uh, increase based on preference for seafood. I mean, that's that's total. That's my total guess, and I could be wrong. But I think uh, isn't it isn't, isn't these rise in beef and pork is, has a lot to do with drought at this point. Very good point, very good point. And, and I think it w 
there is a tendency, and I probably did that somewhat today, is to to kind of forget about our other protein sources. Um, but as mentioned earlier, um, you know, we are all in this together, and we got to be careful that we do send a, a very cohesive message.